All right, welcome back to Making the Argument. A lot of things have happened over the last couple of weeks, but guess what? Probably the most surprising is it looks like Ukraine might lose the war and it's all your fault. That's right. It's it's all your fault. And we're going to explain why that is because there are three major points, right? Three things that have happened over the last couple of weeks that could give us some indication of what's going to happen to the war in Ukraine, why it matters to you, and how there are already different elements taking steps forward that could lead us in one of two directions. It could lead us to a point where we finally say the war in Ukraine is over or massive escalation. We're going to discuss what those three things are, why apparently it's all your fault, and more coming up on this episode of Making the Argument brought to you by Good Ranchers. We've had a couple of folks ask us to do an episode on this very topic in our community chat. And if you aren't already a member, I hope you'll go down to the link in the description, click that link, join there, introduce yourself. I'm sure the whole community would love to get to know you. And let's continue the conversation there right after this episode. All right. As always, I am your host, Nick Freitas. And a little bit of background about me for the purposes of this discussion, for those of you that may be wa never watched before, um, back before I was doing the work that I'm doing in Richmond right now, uh, back when I was still a good, honest human being, uh, I was a member of Army Special Forces, specifically First Special Forces Group. I uh, did a couple of combat tours over in Iraq and specifically focused on things like counterterrorism, unconventional warfare, and counterinsurgency amongst other things. And so I'm going to be using some of that experience, some of that education to discuss this issue today. With me, as always, my beautiful bride, Tina, queen of the bees. Hello, everyone. And then we have our resident historian and political prognosticator, Master Hines. How are you doing, Christian? I'm doing well. Looking forward to this. And of course, we have our producer of producers, Nicholas Hamilton, the good Hamilton, the one that doesn't like central banking. Uh, it hasn't changed to bad Hamilton yet, so I'm happy. Okay, good. Well, you know, we'll, we'll keep an eye on you. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, look, I, like I said before, this, this really comes down to uh, why is Ukraine losing potentially all of your fault? And we're going to get to that. But the first thing that we need to do is bring everyone up to speed on what exactly is going on. So let's do a very, very quick recap, right? Russia invades Ukraine, right? A lot of people would have you believe this is just completely unprovoked and, and out of the blue. Now, before I get too far down this, I want you to know, I don't think Russia should have invaded Ukraine, but they did. And the opening strike within Ukraine was actually highly successful. You saw the Russians coming in from, uh, you know, coming in from the east, from the southeast, from the north. And it looked as if they were just going to completely roll across all of Ukraine within a couple of months. And that was going to be it, right? That was going to be it. And very early on, one of the things that this channel talked about was we said, okay, the Russians have moved very, very quickly. However, They've really, really outspent their supply lines, and it's going to be hard to keep these. In, it's going to be hard to keep these supply lines intact, especially when you have major urban areas that have not been completely pacified. And if they don't take out Zelensky right away, if they don't destroy pretty much any semblance of the Ukrainian military, if they don't do those two things, right? If if Ukraine can kind of hang on just long enough to blunt the attack, to fall back to defensible lines, and then basically buy themselves enough time for the West to come in with massive amounts of money and equipment, this could go bad for Russia. And lo and behold, that's kind of what happened, right? The Russians went a little bit too far, too fast, couldn't get rid of Zelensky, couldn't completely destroy the Ukrainian military. And the end result was is that they ended up having to retrench, right? Not to mention the fact that massive amounts of money and equipment from the West pretty much put the Ukraine in a position to where they were able to, you know, blunt the superior uh, amount of um, basically uh, equipment and uh, numbers that that the Russians had at the at the outbreak of the war. So what happened was is they they pushed the Russians all the way back to the lines past the or, or excuse me uh, east of the Dnieper. And then kind of in, in the Donbass region, and then what ended up happening is you had this stalemate start to take place. Again, this is a very quick overview. You had the stalemate that started to take place where neither side was able to um, establish air superiority. So this was largely a slugfest between armor and infantry. The, Ukraine is actually kind of famous for its its large scale armor battles throughout history uh, due to due to flat terrain within various areas of it. But they they pretty much had the, these various these lines where you started to see trenches and all of a sudden what started off is kind of a, a high mobile, um, you know, maneuver warfare conflict stalemated into something that looked like it was out of World War One, 
Why were you? You've got pictures of troops in trench. You've got massive defense works going on. You've got you know um, Russian engineers coming in, essentially coming up with uh, uh, various tank barriers um, in, in order to blunt the Ukrainian counteroffensive. Um, so, so that's where we've been at, right? And and so instead of seeing these wide sweeping movements that we saw at the beginning of the war, where it was the Russians coming in and taking massive amounts of of territory, and then the Ukrainians launching their their counteroffensive and and taking massive amounts of territory back, then you started to see this slugfest taking place around areas like Bakhmut and others. And and we're gonna we're gonna get into a little bit more of that, um, Christian. You've got some other things too that you want to point out here that's kind of important to. You know, and I just did like the thirty thousand foot level. Bring us into like maybe the the one thousand foot level <laughs> on some major offensive that took place, um, and and then the breakdown between Ukrainian uh, the Ukrainian military as far as personnel and equipment, Russian uh, military as far as personnel and equipment, and where we're at now, and why what has just happened over the last couple of weeks is is probably the most significant thing to have taken place, and I would guess you know maybe a year uh, in in the war in Ukraine. Sure. Okay. So I'll try to give you the 10,000 foot view. I'll, I'll, I'll do you one better. Um, <laughs> so I've got what's called the deep state map pulled up, which I think is kind of a, a funny name. This is a map that pro-Ukrainian sources actually compiled that shows the situation from a visual standpoint since the beginning of the war. And it actually has like a timetable and everything. You, you could play around with this and see, you know, like, like who controlled what, who took what piece of territory on a day-by-day basis. But this is the current state of the situation right now. You see Kiev up here in the corner. The green parts of the map, I'm going to try to explain this for our audio listeners only. The green parts of the map are parts of Ukraine that Russia invaded, usually at the very start of the war, that they briefly occupied that Ukraine managed to push back and liberate. So what you see is what Nick was bringing up earlier, that at the start of the war, Russia came in from Belarus, they came in from the northern front, and they tried to basically encircle Kiev and, and, and knock out the Ukrainian government right from the start. And you see that they didn't really actually consolidate the north. They were just coming in with these armored columns, completely unsupported, just trying to do a mad dash for the capital. And that ended up failing in, in April and May 2022, when the Russians ended up pulling back. And eventually, they, they pulled back entirely from the northern front. Northern front completely collapsed. Now it's all the way back to the Russo-Ukrainian border. What you saw at the end of 2022 was something different. By the end of 2022, so like September, October of that year, Ukraine had about like seven, eight hundred thousand men under arms, and Russia only had about three hundred ish thousand, arguably two hundred and fifty thousand men in Ukraine. So Ukraine had had about like more than a three to one numerical advantage, which is usually, and Nick, you know this, that that's usually more favorable odds to actually conduct some counteroffensives. So what you saw to the, give to give you to give you an idea, U.S. military doctrine usually centers around this idea that in order to engage in offensive operations, you want to have three to one odds. Yeah. So. Ukraine had the numerical advantage, and by that point, they had um, they had enough Western aid that had been coming in. You know, at this point, you're like six, seven, eight, nine months into the war. Ukraine had the numbers and the the equipment to launch two major counteroffensives that you saw um, near the end of 2022. And the first one that um, that you saw was the liberation of the northern bank of the Dnieper River along the Kherson Oblast. Kherson is one of the largest cities in Ukraine. It's it's like situ- it's a port city, basically, that's situated on the the mouth of the Dnieper as it flows into the Black Sea. So they liberated the entire northern bank of it. The Russians kept the southern bank of the Dnieper River. But then in the north, near the border with Russia, you saw another counteroffensive in Kharkiv, formerly known of Kharkov. Um, Kharkov uh, famously was actually the site of three of the most important battles of World War II, including some of the largest tank battles of the war between the Nazis and the Soviets. And the Ukrainian counteroffensive in Kharkiv was massively successful, uh, like arguably more successful than anybody expected. The Ukrainians managed to push the Russians all the way back to the Oskil River and basically consolidate that front line. But then what you saw at the end of 2022 going into 2023 was is that they kind of started to run out of steam in part because they had launched two massive counteroffensives, liberated huge amounts of territory. And more importantly, Russia's numerical disadvantage slowly started to dissipate. So remember what I said earlier, that at one point, Russia had only like 250,000 men in Ukraine. Well, over time, Russia managed to increase the number of men. So by 2023, Ukraine had a million men under arms and Russia had 500,000. And so what you saw was is that that three to one numerical advantage for Ukraine became a two to one numerical advantage. 
And then throughout 2023, you saw some battles that you mentioned earlier, Bakhmut being the most the most prominent of them that took place in the in the spring and early summer. At the end of summer, there was an attempted Ukrainian counteroffensive that was massively hyped, I would argue overhyped in the West. Yeah. And you see this little tiny bulge right here in the Zaporizhia yeah. front. That was what they gained from the counteroffensive. And if you zoom out, you can see that's it. This is this right is there. one area too where we'll we'll get into a little bit, we'll get into this a little bit more detail later. Yeah. But when 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 the West was really pushing the idea that and now, you know, this is the Ukrainians really striking back and this is going to be the the push to basically cut off Crimea to to you know split the the Russian uh, forces between north and south on on the eastern bank of the Dnieper and uh, this is going to be kind of the the beginning of the end and I mean we were looking at this time going yeah I don't I don't think so and and that wasn't because we weren't it's not because we didn't want it to happen it was because we were just looking at the the data and saying yeah I, I don't think this is going to accomplish what, what people think it is yeah fun fun um, story I remember that you and I had had arguments. In like July and August, around the time of the Wagner coup, um, and and I was like, I, I had bought into the hype. I, I'll, I'll admit it. I, I'll, I'll totally admit where I was wrong. I bought into the hype and thought like, there's a chance. Fifty. I, I thought it was like fifty percent chance that Ukraine was going to break through the what's called the Surovikin line, which is the massive Russian fortifications that had been constructed along this entire flatland run, uh, um, running from the Dnieper River and the. Um, uh, former reservoir that got blown to pieces last summer and the city of Donetsk. This entire front line here, which is basically flatland, it's like World War One style trenches, which I never thought you would see in a place like Ukraine. And mm -hmm. so I was just convinced you're going to see a return to, to maneuver warfare, which I wrote extensively about when I was getting my master's. And I had just been, I, I bought the, you know, I drank the Kool-Aid. And I remember arguing with Nick and Nick was like, I don't think this is going to work. I don't think it's going to go, you know, go places, Ukraine's probably going to come up short and and everybody's going to be massively disappointed. And I was just thinking, man, Nick is just so wrong on this. And no, nope, he was he was totally right. I was totally wrong. I was drinking the propaganda Kool-Aid from the <laughs> Ukrainian side on this, thinking that they were going to break through. And I just wanted to bring that up to give, to give Nick props because Nick, in many respects, privately to me, predicted the World War I style slugfest stalemate that you see right now along the entire front line before anybody else that I knew in a place that nobody in the entire world thought you would see World War I style trenches. And that's what you saw in Bakhmut as well. Bakhmut ended up becoming like a modern day Verdun. And so yeah. to end the whole, you know, 10,000 foot, maybe it is actually a 1,000 foot, you know, <laughs> dive into the history of the war. At the end of 2022, going into this year, what you saw was Russia renewed the initiative for the first time since Bakhmut. They had they had a minor offensive in Bakhmut in 2023, and other than that, they were playing defense, trying to hold the Suravikin line, which they managed to do. The only other prominent place that they fought was in Bakhmut, where they managed to capture the city last year. This year, they've launched some massive offensives, quite frankly, everywhere from the Kharkiv border all the way to the Zaporizhia front where they're trying to push back into this bulge. And most notably, they were, they've were they been fighting in the in the Donbass, Donetsk front. And we're going to get to that in today's episode because there's yeah. been some, quite frankly, devastating defeats that the well, Ukrainians let's not, let's have not, suffered. Let's not, let's not project too much because I, <laughs> I want to, because the first thing I, I want to do, now that we've kind of brought everyone up to speed on, on where th what the situation was on the ground, I want to talk about the Tucker Carlson interview. Right. So that's that's the number. That's the first thing out of the three that we told you we're going to talk about. That's the first thing that we want to talk about this Tucker Carlson interview, because um, this is a this is an interesting scenario. Obviously, the United States um, has taken a, a position on this. Right. And that has been to proactively support uh, the Ukrainians as they fight against the, the Russian invasion. And so there there's a there's kind of this expectation that the american press is going to kind of get on board with what official us policy is now obviously that's not always been the case within us military history you know the the press there was many members of the press that pushed back against you know aspects within vietnam in fact or in fact walter cronkite kind of famously saying that the tet offensive had, had proven that the United States government was not being open and honest about what the actual situation was on the ground over there is in, in many ways credited for really helping to turn U.S. public opinion against the war. But when we look at someone like Tucker Carlson going over there to talk to a head of state, um, 
that the United States considers at this point to be, you know, hostile, if not an outright enemy, that's that's more unusual, right? That's more unusual. We don't we don't see that as much in 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 um, U.S. history with respect to the press, and this is one of the reasons why so many people within the mainstream press um, just went after Tucker Carlson right off the bat, like this just you know, as, as if he wasn't already disqualified in their minds, but you saw a lot of them got there going like, oh, the journalist, you know, Tucker Carlson. And and Tucker Carlson went on, we got a link up right here if you want to see it. If you, if you go to the Tucker Carlson network, he kind of explains, okay, why is he doing this? And I'll, I'll let him, you know, explain his, his own position if you want to go and actually watch that video. But I, I will say that there there is an aspect here that I think needs to be understood um, and, and also needs to be differentiated. It's not as if he went and spoke to Saddam Hussein at, at the opening of the Iraq War. It's not as if it's not as if this would have been the equivalent of him going and, and speaking to Ho Chi Minh during the Vietnam War or Hitler during World War II, right? That's not what was going on. The United States is not actively involved in the Ukraine in the sense that we're sending our own troops over there and fighting it, right? Obviously, the United States has been supporting Ukraine and its efforts, but th this isn't quite as, you know, again, I think there's some members of the press they came out and said, look, this is this is somewhat unprecedented, which would be true. And there's others that just said, oh, well, this is just treachery and and you know, you know, you know, betraying the country and the whole deal. And and I I I think I think that's I think that's a bit much. And in fact, I think it betrays to some degree the unwillingness of the of the press in certain circumstances to ask difficult questions. Because and and I will admit this as someone that when we started the global war on terrorism. Iraq and, and invading Iraq, uh, Iraq oh, excuse me, uh, Afghanistan and invading Iraq, I was right there cheering. We, we had to, of course we had to invade Iraq. And of course we had to take out Saddam Hussein. And of course we had to do all this stuff. And I, I can look back now with a certain degree of, you know, intellectual honesty and say, no, we, we should have asked, we should have asked much more important questions before we launched that operation. And even if, even if there was, you know, even if you want to argue that there was sufficient justification to invade Iraq, the, the overall planning and the complete lack of understanding of what the situation was going to be like on the ground and how it was going to upset things geopolitically. You know, the, there, there are some very legitimate questions that needed to be asked um, and, and to some degree were and, and oftentimes ignored to include by people like me. And so I, I try to learn from my own mistakes on this and say, okay, I don't want to just assume that the reason why all of this is happening is because Putin is just a land-hungry madman that wants to return to the glory of, of Mother Russia, right? Like, I, I, I want to actually understand what motivates him, not because I want to say, oh, well, I guess he's, he's right, and hey, Ukraine, just give everything. That's not the point. The point is, if you don't genuinely understand the true motivations of the person that you're fighting, whether, whether you think you should be fighting them or not— then there, there's no way that you're going to be able to come up with a, a very effective strategy, especially in the sort of war that's being fought right now where the United States is not weighed in to the extent that we're taking over the war and now we're just going to fight it with overwhelming military power. That's not what's going on. We're essentially assisting Ukraine. Well, if you don't properly understand what motivates Russia, then you might not be assisting in the way that you want to or you may be getting yourself involved in something you don't want to be involved in. And I think Tucker Carlson came to the conclusion that the the Western press had bought into a particular narrative about what motivated Russia. And I don't think Tucker Carlson was going over there expecting that, oh, well, Putin's just going to sit down and, and lay it out straight for me and whatever he says, well, that's that's his obvious motivation. I don't think that's what Tucker Carlson anticipated, but I do think he wanted to try to get insight from the Russian perspective on what is motivating them. And... um to the extent that that was possible through this interview or that it revealed things within this interview um, ab about that motivation, that could potentially be useful to the, again, to the Ukrainians. Because the Western press had simply just kind of bought into whatever the, the, the narrative was with respect to this war. And so I think that's what motivated Tucker Carlson to do it. Again, we can argue all day long on, on, you know, did this help Putin more than it helped Ukraine or did it, you know, was it inappropriate for him to do this given the position the United States government has taken? But I think a lot of people, and, and this is something that gets horribly misunderstood by The View and a, a lot of politicians in Washington, D.C., is this idea of, well, the United States has already taken a position, how dare you? 
And I think what more and more people are starting to understand is that a lot of a lot of the American people have been skeptical of our level of involvement on this from 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 early from early on. And that wasn't necessarily because they were all, you know, puppets of Putin or they or they just, you know, were were Russian apologists or whatever. That wasn't the case. I think more than anything, a lot of people, a lot of American people looked at this as, oh my gosh, we just got done in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, right? And, and the the trope that, you know, we fought a 20-year war in Afghanistan to, you know, basically to replace the Taliban with the Taliban, that the the final withdrawal that the Biden administration, you know, managed or, or more appropriately failed to manage was horrible. And yet here we are once again, finding ourselves in, in involved in another war where we're expending massive amounts of treasure. And what's going to happen if it doesn't work? What's going to happen if the Ukrainians can't actually win the war themselves? Is the United States just going to walk away? Or are we going to continue to escalate our, our level of involvement in order to ensure the outcome that the Biden administration wants, right? These are all legitimate questions going on within the minds of Americans right now. And a lot of Americans, even if they don't like Putin, even if they don't trust Putin, even if they think that the Russian invasion was illegitimate, don't necessarily think it's our responsibility, right, to prevent it or, or to, you know, prop up Ukraine until they're able to win. I, I think there's another aspect of this, uh, just the fact that um, we have a society now here in the U.S. that is very skeptical now of any kind of propaganda. Um, we Everybody has just got their feelers out with it and going, I don't know if I can believe this, and I don't know if I can believe that. That that might be a doctored video. This may not be true. Um, you know, this guy running around in military stuff, and he's actually an actor. Maybe he's just acting. You know, there's a lot of... Um, there's there's a lot of skepticism that we have now, partly because we have such so much information coming at us all over the place. But then we've also watched our own government try to suppress valid information, real information, um, and then push propaganda on the other side. And I think that, you know, in the past, we've had folks that are, you know, Okay, our the U.S. says this is the bad guy, so we ice them out and we don't ask them their opinion. And and now you've got people that are going, well, wait a minute. Um, why is the U.S. on this side and not that side? And is there is there more to this story? And, um, you know, we've watched our own country totally suppress information um, on on the Internet and block people's accounts and uh, demonetize people and, and, you know, have the FBI go and and, you know, collaborate with some of these platforms and things like that. I think we've come to a point now where we're not just willing to hear whatever the U.S. wants to say is the case and and take that propaganda. You know, our own country has propagandized us so much that now, now we're just kind of looking for it under every rock. Do you feel like that's one of the reasons why um, Tucker decided, hey, let's go get this guy's point of view? No, I, I think that's an excellent point. If, if I had to summarize it all, I, I would say that once upon a time, the United States, the, the population, U.S. citizens, once upon a time, generally believed that the United States government, yeah, it wasn't always telling you the whole truth, but it was generally the truth. And because we had a free press, well, the free press was going to hold the government accountable on some of those gray areas, but but ultimately we would get to the truth. And what happened during COVID is half the population found out what it was like to be on the other side of propaganda from the United States government and from a complicit media. And it completely broke trust with a lot of agencies within the United States government, as well as the government itself to some degree, as well as the media outlets that the American people thought were there to hold the U.S. government accountable. Mm -hmm. And so when, when you broke that trust... Well, well, now you're trying to take that, you're trying to get, get us involved in another war and the credibility of both, you know, government institutions and media institutions is at an all-time low. So I think you're right. I think, I think the American media and the American government still has not come to grips with the enormous damage that was done to their credibility during COVID because, again— that was the point where Americans found themselves on the receiving end of propaganda and it was directed at them, right? It, it's one thing to be a victim of propaganda when it's directed at someone else. 
right? Where, where the, these are the bad guys, these are the good guys. That's the propaganda. It's another thing to find your, your own government calling you the bad guy because you're asking what you believe to be very, very reasonable questions about things like, hey, where did this virus originate at? And do these masks really work? And should we really shut down the economy? And should we really print $3 trillion, right? And, and should we really be, you know, you know, forcing kids out of schools for a year? They became, they became the enemy essentially, and so now they're looking at it going like, no, you don't, you don't have the same credibility with me anymore, and I'm going to question you. And so when Tucker Carlson goes over to Russia and says, okay, I'm not saying Putin's the good guy, I'm not saying Russia is in the right, but I at least want to understand where they're coming from, I think there's a lot of Americans that are now looking at this going, yeah, I want to know too. And because they consider, many people consider Tucker to be at least somebody that is willing to go out there and have a, a, a conversation and ask tough questions. You know, remember, no, not a lot of people were watching the presidential debates in this country, but they did tune in for when Tucker Carlson was asking Republican candidates tough questions because they thought he would ask tough questions. So, I, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. And so when it comes to the should he have done it, say whatever you want. I'm just trying to explain the reason why I think he did it and the reason why I think a lot of people were actually grateful that he did it. And this kind of moves to the second or to the next point here. And that is what did it actually reveal? And one of the things that I think people were able to see about Putin is again, I'm not a fan of Putin. I don't trust him at all. Um, but I don't think there's, if you're trying to say that Putin is just some sort of, again, despotic man, man who, you know, just wants to take land because he can, I think that's a complete misreading of the situation. And, and the first, you know, 30 minutes where, where Putin sat there and, and from memory went through kind of the, the history of Russia and their, their interactions with Ukraine and this territory and the various peoples which, which live in the region. You would have to look at that. And I, I think, you know, and, and again, we, we call Christian the resident historian for a reason. I would say that as Putin was kind of laying out that, that historical setting with respect to Ukraine and Russia, um, <laughs> There was a lot of, you know, verifiably accurate history involved in that. Um, I think there were other things that that Putin revealed during that discussion that indicated to me that he's probably bought into some of his own propaganda. I mean, when when he starts describing Stalin as well, Stalin, according to some people, did some bad things. Like, what do you mean, according to some people, right? <laughs> And then talking about how, oh, well, when Poland collaborated with the Nazis, it's like, yeah, I seem to recall you also collaborating with the Nazis to carve up Poland, right? Not to mention most of Eastern Europe. So th there, was, there was definitely some of this kind of revisionist history that was going on as, as Putin explained it. And on top of that, he also made some other claims that I think are verifiably false. Maybe other people would argue that it's debatable, but China does not have a larger economy than the United States. I don't believe the BRICS has a larger economy than the G7. I don't believe Russia has the largest economy in Europe, right? These, these were some of the claims that were being made where I'm looking at that going, to me, that seems very verifiably false. Uh, but he seemed very, very convinced of it. And, and I don't know, at that point, I don't know if he is pushing out information which he just thinks is advantageous to his side, like propaganda, or if he honestly believes these things. And so... You know, th those were some of the things that I think were revealed in that first like 30, 40 minutes of the interview as, as Putin went through and explained, you know, some of the motivation and some of the historical background for why Russia did what it did. Um, there were some other things. We have a clip. Christian, would you bring in this other clip? And we're going to we're going to gonna roll through this. Um, I, I want to apologize up front. You know, some of the clips that we bring up, we, we don't play in their entirety. Um, we, we want you to know where they are if you want to go look at them yourself or if you want to review them. Um, but obviously, there's some issues with respect to our own videos potentially getting you know taken down or whatnot if we're, if we're using um, other material. But is, is let's this go ahead the clip? Is this the clip of Putin um, saying that they have better meat over there in uh, Russia <laughs> no. than we do here? With good American beef. That's one of the well, verifiably and, and false claims that... <laughs> that would be a verifiably false claim. And, 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 I, and I will tell you, the way, the way you know that too is most people, like Tucker Carlson had this big thing where he went to a grocery store in Russia and he's talking about this and he's talking about that. And, oh my gosh, look at this wonderful grocery store. And, and people in the United States actually go, when we go to our grocery stores, one of the biggest misconceptions, if you actually wanted a, a clear-cut case of propaganda, is they will see meat as an American product 
without knowing that the way the laws are written in the United States, you can actually have something raised on a feedlot in Mexico or some other country come over to the United States. And as long as it goes through a portion of the processing, now it is a American meat product, which is why Good Ranchers, right, has a mission. And one of that missions is to once again, cut through the propaganda and actually provide you American meat. That means raised here. That means processed here. They, they have all kinds of, of deals and arrangements with, with various farms throughout the United States so that when you get good ranchers beef, when you get good ranchers poultry, when you get good ranchers pork, right, you know you're getting an American product. And, and we're not talking about that fake American product where it's like, yeah, feedlot foreign country came over here and then boom, slap it with a, you know, USA sticker. And now you think you're getting something that you're not actually getting. And this is important because if you go to Good Ranchers right now, you go to goodranchers.com, you use promo code Nick and you sign up for one of their subscriptions in the month of February, you're also going to get free bacon with your subscription. Not only that, but they're willing to commit. If you're willing to commit to them, they're willing to commit to you. And that is four years of free bacon with your subscription, right? Because it's leap year. And so in honor of leap year, they're going to give you the best American raised beef, right? With free bacon. So go over to goodranchers.com, use promo code Nick, sign up for one of their subscriptions, get some of the best American beef, poultry, pork, and wild caught seafood, right? And Good Ranchers throws in free bacon with your subscription for up to four years if you sign up and stick with them. I, I think that's a great deal. Plus, it's a way to fight against the propaganda with respect to your meat. All right, let's go ahead and get back to this real quick. Thanks, thanks, that honey, was, for like that, cueing that me into nice, that one. Nice You're ad transition, Tina. Yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. Tina, that was Tina's competition. Me what know. would you do without me here? Yeah. I know. I, I don't know. I don't. I don't yeah. want to think about it. I don't want to think about it. All, All right, right. So let's, so let's look at there. There was this video that came out that I thought was pretty interesting. It was put out by the Telegraph, and they were talking about it, the the video was five things that were revealed with the Putin interview. I, I think the first one was they were talking about uh, Elon Musk is unstoppable. Whatever. Um, they were talking about AI and whatnot. Again, I don't think it was a big deal. If you want to go and watch the video, you can. The I, thought, I actually one, thought that was kind of interesting that Tucker Carlson asked Putin some questions that weren't about like geopolitics and stuff like that. But it, it obviously doesn't have to do with like the the situation in Ukraine and the U.S. arming of Ukraine and the war in Ukraine and how yeah. long this is going to drag out and stuff like that. So if you're interested in the other stuff, I mean, go watch the full interview that I've got here. Obviously, we're not going to play the two hour long interview, but like it's on Twitter. Sorry, X. Yeah. Right. Like Tucker Carlson just pasted it on a free platform for you to watch. Yeah, you can. Well, but bring bring up that bring up that screen again because I want people to see this. So the the out of the five things that the Telegraph said, you know, the the second one they said was Putin threatens World War Three, and the reason why I wanted to bring this up before we move to the the third one is because if you actually watch the interview, I think it was actually a little bit disingenuous of the Telegraph to describe it this way, because think think about the question that that. Tucker Carlson is asking, he's talking about U.S. involvement, he's talking about potential escalation and things of that nature. And what, what Putin is not saying, I want World War III, Putin laid out this argument for why they think certain areas of the Ukraine are, you know, you know again, traditionally Russian. There's obviously a lot of Russian people that live in these areas of, of Ukraine. Um, they were very, they were very um, you know, openly uh, frustrated with the expansion of NATO um, going further and further in east and closer to Russia. They were very, very frustrated with uh, what they saw as Western involvement in Ukrainian elections in order to, you know, essentially overthrow a pro-Russian um, Ukrainian president for a pro-Western Ukrainian president. So th there's there's all these things that, that he's gone into, you know, uh, attempting to justify the invasion. And Carlson's asking him questions about, you know, the U.S. potentially getting involved at uh, you know a higher degree, what about boots on the ground? And you know, at this point, what is Putin supposed to say? Right? Is Putin supposed to say, "Oh, well, yeah, if the U.S. if the U.S. got involved with ground forces, we'd be done." Right? Like, he's not going to say that. So he he's got to say, "Well, if if obviously if the West escalates, then we're going to have to escalate as well." And one of the things that that Putin says here that I think a lot of people in the West are very very or, or like a lot of Western media and the Biden administration are very upset about is that Putin looks at Tucker Carlson and he basically says, do you guys not have anything better to do? Like, this isn't your part of the world. You're not allied. Like you, it's not like you had treaties with Ukraine. 
that this isn't, you know, a war. Why is it like you have your own problems at the border? You have your own problems here. Why are you getting involved in this? Why, why are you going to, you know, come over here and fight and die for this? And the thing is, is that, again, regardless of what you think of Putin or the Russian invasion, that resonates with a lot of people. And so I don't think it was necessarily that Putin was threatening World War III here. He was essentially saying that, yes, if it escalates, Russia will escalate as well. And again, this is not me defending Putin. This is me just trying to say, let, let's have an accurate representation of what was going on at this stage in the interview. And this is one of the reasons why people have a real problem with the Western press is it it, it feels more like propaganda than it does actual reporting. Um, let's go ahead and go to the, the third point. They said, uh, Boris Johnson is the reason Ukraine is still fighting. And, and again, this this has to do, this was kind of funny, but it, but it also has to do with the fact that um, he, he's not wrong. I want to chalk it up to Boris Johnson, but he, he's not wrong that without a major Western infusion of, of cash and equipment, Ukraine would be done. Um, there's, there's just no question. Ukraine did not have the, the economy, the personnel, the military uh, to be able to, you know, fight this war on their own. And kind of like we discussed earlier with, you know, Russia trying to knock Ukraine out very, very quickly, that was probably critical to their overall strategy, both with respect to territorial gains, as well as some of the other things that they wanted, but also understanding that if, if the West was able to get money and material over to Ukraine, it was going to cause massive problems for the Russian military. And it did. The problem now is, okay, is it sufficient in and of itself to be able to get Ukraine over the hump and to fully push Russia out, out of Ukraine? And, and so far, it hasn't been. Let's go to the fourth point. Um, the fourth point was, okay, this one was, this one was interesting, I think, in part because I think a lot of people believe this. Um, and I, I haven't made up my mind on what I believe on this, but the whole idea of who blew up Nord Stream. Right, so so Nord Stream was you know one of the major pipelines, um, and and this is a this is a very important to both European economies and the Russian economy. Right, it's absolutely critical for the for the Russian economy. Um, they're they're a major exporter of of energy to the rest of Europe. Interestingly enough, this is one of the things that Trump warned. European countries and specifically Germany about, he said, look, you you guys are, you guys are outsourcing your energy policy to a, a Swedish girl, you know, a, a Swedish teenager, and you're becoming overly dependent on, on Russia for your energy. And it's, and it's putting you in a vulnerable position. And it was funny because at the time the German delegation at the UN and the American press were all mocking Donald Trump. Like he didn't know what he was talking about. Well, lo and behold, the, the war starts and you start off with these embargoes against Russian um, resources and this had massive consequences for the European European economies, not to mention just keeping the heat on. And and so this whole idea of when when Nord Stream blew up, it was okay. Who was who was behind this? And Russia said from the get go that it, it wasn't them. And what he was basically saying in the interview to Tucker was, look, this is not necessarily an easy thing to do. And so you have to ask yourself the questions, who has the motivation to do it? Who has the resources to do it? Right. If you were, if you're looking at this as a, a crime scene, right, murder, you would talk about, you know, motive, method and opportunity. And Putin was laying out the case that, okay, well, the CIA had motive, method, and opportunity to be able to do something like this, and it and it furthered their efforts by potentially hamstringing um, the, the Russian economy. Now, again, that's not my claim. I'm not claiming the CIA did this, but I do think that, once again, you're operating at, at a time and place where when the U.S. government says, absolutely not, we didn't do anything like this, half the American population is saying, yeah, I, I also remember when you were telling me that the you know the, the lab in Wuhan had nothing to do with covid right i don't buy it anymore and so i i do think it was i do think it was one of the more interesting parts of the conversation because putin's laying out the claim that hey we didn't do this and actually you guys have a greater motivation to do it than we would have um take that for for what you will um and what's the uh, the fifth point i thought this was actually a kind of a good thing that that tucker carlson brought this up um because, um, and I'm going to butcher his last say, name, this is, this is Putin being willing to release Evan uh, Gershkovich. Yes. Um, or Gershkovich. Gershkovich was a, um, well, is a, a, I believe he's actually an American journalist that's, mm -hmm. that's held hostage in Russia. He's, he's, he's in prison under kind of trumped up charges of, you know, being a spy, basically. Yeah. When in reality, what he was is, if I recall correctly, he was a journalist that was, 
you know, that th- uncovered stuff that the Russians, you know, classified as being, you know, overly sensitive and therefore we're going to arrest you and throw you in prison when in reality he was just doing his job. Yeah. And I mean, this is something to say that like, for anybody that wants to accuse myself or Nick of being like Putin apologists, I mean, here's the part where uh, there is no room for for defending this man whatsoever. Russia does not have the degree of, of freedom of press and speech that the United States has, no. point blank. There is a, a fraction of the number of freedoms that we enjoy in the West, particularly in the United States, in Russia. For example, there was an opposition leader that died in Russia very recently, just a few days ago, and... Um, and and th- that's a whole nother topic for another day about, you know, the circumstances through which he was thrown in prison and stuff like that. I know the Russians tried to claim, oh, we tried to overthrow the government and stuff like that. The, the Setting that stuff aside, the circumstances through which he was in prison and stuff like that, this opposition leader dies and there's a chunk of the Russian population. They're definitely a minority, but there's a chunk of the Russian population that's like mourning this guy's death. And there were over 400 people that were arrested in cities like St. Petersburg and Moscow for simply assembling to, to basically pay tribute to this guy. Mm-hmm. And I mean, there's there's been footage of, you know, like 20-something, 30-something-year-old high school students, middle school, you know, college students being arrested by the, the Russian police. And I, I mean, like, their secret police, like, the you know, the successor to the KGB, right? The, the FSB. Um, for simply assembling... And, and doing nothing else. And so Russia does not have freedom of assembly. They do not have freedom of speech. And Russia routinely will jail people for simply saying things that are out of line with the with the narrative that the Russian government puts out. If you, pub, for example, if you publish figures, if you compile figures of the number of deaths in Ukraine right now among the Russian army and you publish them in Russia, if you go on like Telegram, which is very popular in Russia, you 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 publish the number of people that, that, you know, are killed on a weekly basis or monthly basis in Russia, you can be thrown in prison for that. If well, you was- I think th- this is this is one of the things when we ask uh, overall, with everything that has happened, right, in the, in the last couple of weeks, the Tucker Carlson interview and everything else, to your point, what, what does it reveal about Putin and Russia? If I had to sum it up, I, I would say that Putin is an authoritarian. Right? There's no question. I, th- I think Putin is an authoritarian for, for all the reasons that you just mentioned. I think Putin is aggressive. Um, I, I think Putin is desperate to to hold on to power. Um, I also think Putin is highly intelligent. And I think the other thing that you have to conclude is that a, a lot of the impressions that the West has for why Russia went to war and why Russia invaded Ukraine was heavily o- oversimplified, right? Which is you yes. know no shock there. But there were legitimate grievances that Russia had with the West, especially with things like the expansion of NATO and the interference within Ukrainian elections. Um, th- there were legitimate grievances that Russia had. Again, I don't think that justifies the Russian invasion. I don't, and again, I, I don't think Putin is a good guy. I, I think he's a very, very dangerous enemy, and, I, and I'll list him as an enemy. But I'm at least grateful to have a better understanding of, again, where where he's coming from, what motivates him, um, because I don't think I don't think we were getting that from the mainstream American press. No, we weren't. And and the, the, the last point to number five, Nick, is that like I do give Tucker a lot of for everybody saying Tucker Carlson is a traitor. How can yeah. he be a traitor? He's not a citizen of Ukraine. <laughs> I yeah. just I, I love this idea that like if you don't support sending another hundred billion dollars to a country three thousand miles away from the United States at a time when there's more illegal immigrants pouring across the border than there are American citizens being born on a monthly basis right now in the U.S. So we have problems with our own border, which is, by the way, you brought up something that Putin brought up in this interview, yeah. that don't you have better things to deal with? Arguably, yes. We have our own our own problems at home, and we're throwing money at, at countries that are thousands of miles away from us. And now you can say, well, we still need to throw money at these countries. Okay, fair enough. But you can't go to the average American that Tucker Carlson is speaking to and saying, you're a traitor or you're a bad person because you care more about the border with Mexico than you care about the border with Russia and Ukraine. That's nonsensical. Yeah. How about you fix the problem with the border and, and it, along Mexico, and then some of these people might be more reasonable when you say we need to keep sending supplies to Ukraine. And I think that, that that's what Tucker was getting to here. But 
to call Tucker like a traitor or a Putin apologist when he asked some difficult questions like, will you release this journalist? And he pressed him on this. And I give yeah. him credit for doing it. And he got Putin into a position where he publicly came out and said, OK, we, we would be willing to negotiate with the U.S. to potentially release this guy, maybe as a gesture of goodwill. I mean, yeah, he, 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 he gave a he gave a noncommittal, you know, yes. typical politician oh, we're, thing, we're in negotiations right? but, and stuff like that. To your second yeah. point, though, about the whole historical context, I actually found a paper that was published before I was even born yeah, in January 1994. This was an academic peer reviewed paper. This was, I believe, published in a Harvard journal. Back um, when peer review meant something. It's a <laughs> yeah, back, back when peer review actually meant something. And it's a it's a really good paper and it talks about the geopolitical situation of the ex-Soviet republics that made up, you know, the former Soviet Union shortly after it disintegrated. Again, this is 1984. So this is 3 years after the the fir, you know, permanent dissolution of the Soviet Union which took place in December 1991. And you know, there, it's a long paper. It's 93 pages. Obviously, we're not going to go through the entire thing. But there's a segment in here on the chapter on Ukraine talking about the relationship between Russia and Ukraine. Remember, this is January 1994. This is before Putin even comes onto the scene. Yeah. Putin's like a mid-level politician at this point. He's not He's not the president of Russia, right? I mean, this is, this is the Boris Yeltsin administration, I believe. And um, when it gets to the topic of Ukraine, there's actually some interesting things that are brought up. For example, it brings up the economic situation in Ukraine and how Ukraine does not engage in free market reforms after it gets its independence. It actually sticks with the communist model, and there's like price controls and rent controls and government subsidies and state-owned corporations, and Ukraine's in an economic depression that's even worse than the one that Russia and some of the other ex-Soviet republics are in, because Russia also fell into a recession after the collapse of the Soviet Union. But in Ukraine, it was worse because they kept the government control over the economy. And the economic depression was particularly hard hit in the Donbass region. And the Donbass region is, for, for those who, who want to understand briefly, the Donbass region is the eastern part of Ukraine. It's basically like Donetsk and Luhansk, those two oblasts, the ones that, that have been in open revolt against. Just so you know, an oblast is like a region. Yeah, it's That's like their what, state yeah. or province. It's, yeah. it's a term yeah. to describe an administrative region. And, and so those are the two most eastern regions in Ukraine that have the most number of Russian speakers other than the Crimean Peninsula. And they are the economic heartland of Ukraine in terms of industrial capability. The overwhelming majority of the iron mines are in there. When we talk about the recent battle that was actually fought, there was a prominent landmark in the city of Avdika that was actually a coke plant, to give you an idea of, of the industrialization of this region. And the, the Donbass region also had, it's basically like the Rhineland of Ukraine. It's where the vast majority of, of the industrialization took place. And it's also the most Russian part of the country. And the economic depression that hit Ukraine was so bad that this paper goes out to say, and again, this is January 1994, it goes out to say, the ethnic Russian-dominated Crimean Peninsula has been singled out and targeted by Moscow. It has offered dual citizenship to Crimean Russians and promoted Crimean presidential candidates oriented towards Russia. Ukraine had, similar to how we have governors, they had these like presidential candidates for oblasts, right? So not president of the country. It's like leader of your little administrative unit within the country. Um, and so then it goes on to say promoted uh, Crimean presidential candidates oriented towards Russia. Moscow has trumpeted the economic grievances of ethnic Russians in Ukraine's eastern provinces, particularly the miners in the Donetsk region, who now regret voting for Ukrainian independence. In addition, it has reminded Ukraine that agreements on the inviolability of its borders with Russia are contingent on Ukraine's continued membership in the Commonwealth of Independent States. This was like the loose confederation that, um, that kind of replaced like the Soviet zone. Union. Yeah, it was like yeah. a free trade zone. It was like a loose political confederation that replaced the Soviet Union. And then it goes on to conclude in this paragraph that if Ukraine chooses to distance itself from Russia, territorial dismemberment is a distinct possibility. <laughs> Yeah. And then so, it brings up some like quotes from like Boris Yeltsin's administration, who again yeah. was Russia at this point was way more liberal than it currently is now. It was it, at the time we thought that it was moving in a more pro West direction. Russia was actually trying to. Well, and, and it was. I mean, that that's important to understand is that it, it Yeltsin was. I mean, he came he came and spoke in Congress, and you know, um, and, and and I think there was some anticipation that there there would be increased trade, increase, and and there and there was compared to like the Cold War, but I I don't think, um, I, I think for Russian politicians and whatnot, there was also some confusion with respect to the growth and expansion of like NATO 
and, and things of that nature as well. And so yeah, th this that, idea that once, okay, once we're no longer the Soviet Union anymore, um, you know, th things are going to drastically change. And obviously there was still a degree of mistrust that took place. And I don't think that was unreasonable. And, and so like the reason I bring up this paper and I agree, Nick, the, the reason I bring yeah. up this paper is because I just wanted to point out that like this, this actually precedes Putin massively so like like this has been going on for over 30 years at this point you could argue it goes all the way back to when when khrushchev transferred the crimean peninsula from the russian uh you know soviet federal um republic the russian part of the soviet union to the ukrainian part of the soviet union the ukrainian ssr that took place in the 50s but like this has certainly been going on since the disintegration of the soviet union this this thing that eventually led to the invasion that took place in 2022 that's still ongoing today and the reason I bring this up is because it, I, I think in the West, we've been given this narrative that Putin woke up one day and decided, hmm, I'm going to invade a sovereign country for no pretense and no reason whatsoever and kill a mm. half million people. Yeah. Now, two things can be true at the same time. It is amoral to the extreme that Putin invaded a sovereign country and has killed well over 500,000 people in that process. It's arguably over six or 700,000 at this point. And, and honestly, by the time this war ends, it's going to be over a million. Do you just say amoral or do you mean immoral? Immoral. Okay. It, 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 sorry, if I it, I meant I to say immoral. immoral. Yeah, I meant to yeah. say immoral. It is, it it is certainly unethical. I would argue evil to invade a sovereign country and kill over five hundred thousand people in less than two years. There, there there is no moral defense to be had there. You can hold that position and still not believe the narrative that, quite frankly, the New York Times, the Wall Street. Yeah. Journal, the Washington Post, MSNBC, CNN, ABC, all the, the legacy media networks that we've talked about extensively on this podcast and how the left has ideologically captured them. You, you can reject their narrative, which is quite frankly a simplistic narrative on this conflict that, oh, Putin bad, Ukraine good, U.S. must send $100 billion to Ukraine, and this is just a fight between good and evil. Quite frankly, no, this is a complex geopolitical dispute that's been going on since 1991. Well, I, I think that's the other thing that's been revealed, right? The, the, we, we talked a little bit about what was revealed about Putin and Russia and its motivations. The other thing that's been revealed is just how absolutely in the bag for whatever the administrative narrative is on all of this, the mainstream press is, right? Just completely and totally in the bag to the point where even if it, it's not It's not as if they couldn't have revealed the truth about what's motivating all the different actors and players in this and then still made a, a, a good, make a good argument for why the U.S. should support Ukraine. They could have done that. They didn't. They chose not to. They get furious and angry at anybody that seeks to understand it beyond what the administrative narrative is, right? And again, once upon a time, that worked to great effect on the American population. It does not anymore. And what we're what we're seeing is that the animosity and the frustration with the press as it relates both to Donald Trump, but also as it relates toward COVID. I really do think COVID was the linchpin. That that is now transferred over to other things as well. It's it's not as if the press just lost credibility with Trump or just lost credibility with um, COVID. No, they lost credibility in general. Like it was already hurting and that killed it. And, and again, that's, that's problematic for a number of reasons. You see the same thing with government agencies. Once upon a time, I don't care who was president, generally speaking, the American public would have been, had a favorable view of the FBI or, you know, the, the secretary of defense or whatever else it was. That isn't the case anymore. Right, and, and that's dangerous for a number of reasons. So th this whole thing with the Tucker Carlson interview didn't just reveal things about Putin or Russia that the American public didn't maybe properly understand. It also revealed, I, I think, something that w was right there on the surface, but it did reveal that just complete lack of credibility with both government agencies and the press in a way that is, I, I think, again, unprecedented in American history. I think- uh, And this moves us into our second part I, here. Sorry, I was and, and that is- Okay, so why is all of this happening right now even more significant than, than it would have been had it happened? You know, if Tucker had done this five months ago, it would still be significant. What people need to understand is the reason why it's so significant right now is because of what's happening on the ground in Ukraine. So Christian, can you bring up some of the maps? Let, let's let everybody know that 
I'll put it this way. I'm willing to bet that the same people that probably could have, you know, let's say people that are like actively following what's going on in the war in Ukraine, the same people that would have told you that, you know, okay, hey, yeah, Ukraine made these massive gains and they pushed the Russians back and the Russians were retreating and they were about to launch a major offensive. Like the same people that could have tracked all of that and said, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm aware of all of it probably have no idea that a significant portion of the Ukrainian army was almost completely surrounded and cut off. Sure. Before we do, Tina, there, there was something that you wanted to bring no, up. No, it's for, okay. Go you ahead. sure? Yeah, we're past it. Okay. Go ahead. Um, so, yeah, to Nick's point, there's been some events that, quite frankly, I think the, the, the press just ignored until five minutes ago. And I've been following it for, for a couple months now. But in the last couple of weeks in particular, Nick, do you remember when I texted you like yeah. a week or two ago? And I was like, there's this city... It's in the suburbs of Donetsk. It's called Avdivka. Yep. That there's a big crisis that's about to unfold here. And I don't think anybody is paying attention to this. This was like February 10th or 11th when I texted you this. And I've got the text messages to prove it. And we went back and forth about it. And I was like, and I started sending you like maps and stuff like that. And I was like, I, I was looking at the day-to-day change on things like the deep state map, which by the way, again, is compiled by pro-Ukrainian sources. There's, there's another set of maps, um, the, uh, um, the Rybar maps, which are compiled by pro-Russian sources. And we can get to those in just a second, because it's important to compare and contrast what both sides are saying, because one side could say, we control this city. And the other side could say, no, we control the city. Right. So I, I was trying to get both sides angle on the situation on the ground to make sure that I wasn't being duped into buying a narrative like I was last year when I thought that Ukraine was going to break through and, you know, get all the way to the Azov Sea. And I think the reason that I fell to that narrative was because, quite frankly, I was just following Western sources. I was just listening to what the Ukrainians were saying. I was just listening to what the New York Times was saying. And I think I I suffered tremendously so because I wasn't getting an accurate depiction of things. Well, I corrected that and started looking at both sides of it. And I, I remember looking at the the day-by-day changes on the maps of this city right here, which is just to the north of the city of Donetsk, which, again, is one of the largest cities in Ukraine. This is the heart of the Donbass region. And, and Donetsk had been controlled by pro-Russian separatists since 2014 when that revolution took place in Ukraine. And so you see on this map, the purple parts of this map have been controlled by pro-Russian forces since 2014. The rest... You know, the red parts have been since Russia invaded in 2022. And I remember looking at the, the timeline here. In fact, um, I, uh, I, I, um, I can pull it up here. And if you go back, what you see is like, here's, here's the 11th. And I'm going to try to explain this for our audio listeners. Here's, here's the situation on the 10th of February. And here's the city of Avdivka, right? And I remember texting Nick and I was like, oh, well, I mean, I was looking back, you know, days before and you can see the Russian advance, you know, into the city in the north. And you also see the advance in the south. And here's like the quarry and everything. Here's the major highways. Here's their advance in the southern suburbs. You know, here's what the situation was at the beginning of February, right? And so I was just looking day by day by day. And I was like, oh my gosh, I know exactly what they're doing. They're going to encircle the city. And I remember texting Nick and I was like, this is, this is a disaster waiting to happen because Ukraine had something like four or 5,000 men in this city. This was arguably the most heavily fortified place in the entire country. And, and to, give, to give everyone an, an, an idea too, like you're talking about four to 5,000 men, you're, you're talking about like the equivalent of like a division, uh, division plus. Like that, that, is a, that is a significant number of troops. Um, cause th- I think sometimes we, we see all these numbers and things like that and we think, oh, you know, is, is that really a, a large amount of it? Yeah. If you have an entire division essentially surrounded and cut off, um, that, that can be very, very problematic. We'll put it that way. And remember, this is just a, like a couple miles from the border that had been in place since 2014, right? So like Russia invaded in 2022 and this place, it didn't gain any ground in part because this has been a frontline city for 10 years, way longer than the invasion that began in 2022. This is going all the way back to when, you know, the, the, you know, Donetsk and Luhansk separatists rose up after the 2014 revolution. So Ukraine has been building fortifications here. They've been deploying troops here. They, they turned this into a fortress city, 
with the intention that one day they would be able to retake Donetsk itself because it's right next door to it. And so I saw like the Russian advance here. And what you see is by the 13th, they cut the highway here. And so by the 13th, again, very few people in the, in the Western press were talking about this. And I was like, Russia has operationally encircled thousands of Ukrainian troops in the most heavily fortified city in the country that Ukraine has spent 10 years building fortifications. There are, there's almost no defenses here along this, this, this ridge that runs to the west of the city because this has been the front line since 2014. And so I remember texting Nick. I'm like, this is a disaster waiting to unfold. And then, woe and behold, what do you see? And I have, I've turned on the map now that shows day by day the, the um, strike places being what Russia captures. What you see is that, like, throughout the entire week and the last week, Russia it just steadily expanded. And then eventually, the Ukrainian military actually fired— Zelensky fired the chief of staff of the Ukrainian military over this disaster, in what? part because he, he called—and and he was actually right. He called at the beginning of this month to pull out of Avdivka. He, he demanded that, that we withdraw from this city because we cannot hold it and we're going to become encircled. And because of internal politics within the Ukrainian military, he was fired and replaced with somebody that agreed with sticking around and holding the city. And what happened was is that literally in the last like 48 hours, Ukraine lost the city entirely and declared, announced, in fact, I actually have the Facebook post from the Ukrainian chief of staff, the new Ukrainian chief of staff. And he says, this was from two days ago. He says, based on the operational situation around Avdivka, in order to avoid the encirclement and save the lives and health of soldiers, the decision was made to withdraw our units from the city and move uh, to defense on more favorable borders. Our soldiers fulfilled their duty, yada, yada. We, and then he goes on yeah. to say, you know, they did their best to destroy the Russian military units and inflicted significant losses. You know, when, when, yeah, one thing I want to correct on the two, I said a division, I, I meant a brigade. It's like a brigade plus or two brigades uh, worth of soldiers. But one, one of the reasons why I want to talk about why, why this is so important. And again, for those of you that couldn't see the screen, if you've ever seen like old battle maps of like the Battle of the Bulge, where you you have this, you know, kind of massive incursion, then it, it slowly gets in, encircled. That's That's kind of what it looked like, right? Not the same size, but kind of what it looked like. The reason why a couple brigades worth of soldiers getting encircled um, is so bad is because this this ends up becoming like a bargaining chip. Um, we we talked about this a little ways back when we were talking about the the Arab Israeli wars and in, in 1973, um, you know 67 and 73. But I, I want to say I think it was 73 where you had um, a massive Egyptian army which was effectively surrounded and at that point could have just been piecemeal destroyed by the Israelis. Um, when you get to a point, it, this is not just as simple as a situation where, um, you know, a brigade had to push back. The fact that they got out of there before they were completely encircled and, and, and captured or put into a situation where they could have just been, you know, destroyed was because it would have, it would have created intense political pressure, um, on, on the Ukrainians. Um, it also would have put intense political pressure on the West with respect to what were they going to do about this? Because now if, if Russia is sitting there and, you know, they're, su they're surrounded, the Ukrainians have nowhere to go and all they have to do is essentially pull in artillery and just bombard them until they're all dead. I mean, that, that makes a, that makes a pretty powerful propaganda tool um, from the Russian perspective. The, the other thing that it demonstrates is the West was so adamant, right? Now we're getting into what is the tactical and strategical importance of this. The tactical importance was is that they, they had to, you know, completely evacuate, uh, you know, um, thousands of troops. They had to, they ended up firing someone. And again, they, they fired the guy that said this was a problem we should pull out. And then they, they fired him when they made him stay. And now they put in someone new. So the internal, the, polit the internal political pressure in Ukraine in order to make offensive gains is starting to far outstrip their military capability to achieve those gains, right? And this is very, very important to understand because if you want to know where massive mistakes get made in warfare, it is when politicians start pushing military commanders to make gains they simply do not possess the capability to make. And... You know, and again, both sides have been guilty of this, right? Russia was guilty at the outset of the war. They wanted to attain gains that they did not possess the military capability to do. Um, now, you could argue on that side that they just kind of, you know, they they 
um, they went a little bit too far too fast and they weren't able to accomplish their goals, right? Had, had you know, a couple of things changed, it, it would have looked like military genius. And this is often the case in war. Um, you know, but for a couple of factors, you're, you're, you're Napoleon or no, you're not. You're, you know, um, I don't know. Think I can't think of a bad military general off the top of my head right now. <laughs> um, you know, you're Napoleon the Third. You're McClellan. Um, yeah, yeah, whatever it is, right? You change a couple of factors and you go from being a genius to being an idiot. Well, in, in this case, the the military the military thought on the ground was is we have to move this out. Political considerations, and, th and this goes for the offensive as well. One of the reasons why I, I said early on that I didn't think the Ukrainian offensive was going to achieve the sort of gains that they expected to gain from it was because all the push was on, well, we gave you all this equipment, we gave you all this money, the, the Russians are on their heels, so, you know, and, and you've, you've made massive gains over, over the last, you know, several months. So clearly you're going to be able to do that now as well. Now that we've given you the Abrams, now that we've given you the leopard tanks, now that you have more javelins, now that you have this, this additional equipment. The problem is, is that having the equipment doesn't mean you have the experience users of the equipment. It doesn't mean that you've been able to effectively train with everybody in order to combine, to conduct combined arms maneuver warfare. It doesn't mean that you have the air superiority to actually back up what you're doing. If you have to slug it out through minefields, and right, and we're not just talking about like one minefield, we're talking about miles upon miles of defense in depth. If you have to slug it through that without air superiority, that's going to cost you a massive amount of casualties. And and if you're Ukraine right now, it, it's fine if we give you more tanks and more everything else. But if you don't have the man, then it doesn't matter. You know, an empty tank has zero combat value. <laughs> and and this is the part where once again now we're running into additional problems with you have a nation that had sixty million people fighting a nation that had over one hundred and fifty million people, right? And and again, a lot of people fled Ukraine. It's not like every military age male immediately showed up and reported for duty. And so now you have a situation where not only did the Ukrainian offensive not materialize with the sort of gains that, that I think were kind of anticipated and promised and hoped for by all the Western countries that have been pouring money and material into Ukraine, but now the Russians have essentially launched a successful counteroffensive, and it's not massive. It's not some huge game changer. It potentially could have been if they would have entirely, if they would have encircled that unit. They, Nick, they've actually launched three offensives at this yeah. point. Although it's worth noting that they do not have massive breakthroughs. Like, remember when I brought up that Ukraine launched these counteroffensives at the end of 2022 and they liberated the northern bank of the Dnieper and, and yeah. Kherson and they liberated the entirety of the Kharkiv Oblast? That was like hundreds of or thousands of square miles. I mean, yeah. tens of thousands of square miles. We're those talking are, those are massive gains. Yeah, that's not what's going on here. We're talking like a, a small sector where Russia had a crucial breakthrough, but it's it hasn't turned into a, a complete route. It's not like the Donetsk front has disintegrated, where it's like the center of the Ukrainian army is gone. That's yeah. not the case. But what is the case is that for ten years, the city of Donetsk could not be used as a crucial communications and logistics hub for the Russian army because it was literally two, three miles away from the Ukrainian front line. And they could they could launch artillery and missile yeah. strikes into Donetsk in order to disrupt, again, this, this city of a million people from being used as a hub through which the Russian army could be given arms and supplies to actually launch attacks in the Donetsk front. There's a reason the Donetsk front didn't go anywhere in two years. Now... A huge chunk of the linchpin that links the Zaporizhia front with the northern front where Kharkiv is, this center portion is now in play because the city of Donetsk is, is has a little bit more breathing room because the Ukrainians got pushed back from literally the city limits. Yeah. And so what you're seeing, I have three maps now. Um, or two more maps to pull up that are actually from the pro-Russian side. This is the Rybar map, which is, again, the Russian interpretation. So I previously showed you the deep state map, which is the pro-Ukrainian side. Here's the Russian take on things. The Rybar map shows the situation in Avdivka. You have Donetsk here in the south that you can't really see. But you, you see the Russians continue to advance even after they took the city itself, which is in the center of this image. They're advancing steadily towards the west in part because the Ukrainians don't have a defensive line set up. Yeah. They already had one in Avdivka. That was the most heavily fortified part of arguably the entire country, and it fell. And so the Ukrainian army is going to have to launch counteroffensives, if anything else, to buy time for the Ukrainians to build defensive lines further to the west that they can actually fall back to. So you're going to see 
not massive maneuver warfare, but you're going to see some back and forth in the next coming weeks or so as the Ukrainians tried to delay the Russian advance long enough for them to set up a more permanent static defensive line around here in places where they previously don't have them. What you're also seeing is in the Bakhmut sector, you're seeing that the Russians have have actually, you know, they have fully taken the city and they're steadily advancing to the west as well. Um, Chasiv Yar, which is a suburb of Bakhmut, is now turning into a frontline city. And so again, Russia is on the offensive, and this is a little bit to the north. And then finally, what you see is in the Zaporizhia front, this bulge that Ukraine formed in their failed summer offensive last year that was, again, the one that was overly hyped that everybody was buying into that they were going to break through the Suravikton line and reach the Azov Sea. The Russians are on the attack again here. They've actually re-entered the, the town of um, uh, Robotin which is like the, it's a small village, but that's the prominent place that Ukraine managed to liberate last year. And it's now, it's now contested again. In fact, it's actually quite likely that Russia will retake it. Now, again, does this mean that like Ukraine's going to collapse? No. Well, no, not tomorrow, not even next week, not next month. It, 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 it's not that, the, that Ukraine is, is collapsing. It's that Ukraine is, is on the defensive in three separate sectors right now. And Russia is not, you know, launching these huge offensives where they're, you know, like encircling whole armies, like when the Germans launched Barbarossa, right? And they took, you know, Mm -hmm. millions of prisoners in the first, you know, opening weeks or something like that. It's not like that. It's not these massive tank, it's not World War II. It's still World War I, but it's it's World War II. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I, I was saying it's still World War One in the sense that this is still attritional warfare. It's many respects still trench warfare. We're talking about gains in the, you know, kilometers or tens of kilometers, not hundreds of miles or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, but but it is, like you said, it is a war of attrition, and that's the problem, right? That's the problem for Ukraine is because right now the West is fighting this on Ukraine's behalf with equipment, but equipment's not the only thing being attrited people are being attrited. And so the question is, is how does Ukraine make up their physical numbers? And this is the, this is why the, the Tucker interview, um, you know, these Russian offensives that are taking place that are seeing some gains. This is why all of this coming about right now is really important because Congress, you right, had been debating whether or not they were going to, you know, basically re-up to support Ukraine to include with the equivalent of like the Marine Corps annual budget, right? So, but again, you can you can sit all that money if you want. You can send more tanks if you want. Because one of the things to keep in mind here is that it's not the United States is just dropping off pallets of cash, right? A lot of our a lot of that contribution that you see going over there is military equipment, right? It's javelins, it's Abrams, it's a whole host of other military equipment. The problem is, is that where Ukraine is going to find themselves very, very soon is needing people. And at that stage, I mean, think about this. If the West is at the point where they have made up their minds that they're only committing material and and funding and Ukraine needs more people, where are they going to get them? Right, because it's not exactly like Ukrainian birth rates are you know, great right now, right? It's it's or have been great. So it, it's not as if they're you know they they have a whole generation of young men that within the next you know year to two are are going to be military age men that can easily go in and replenish their losses, right? They're going to need to get people from somewhere. Where do they get them? Right? Are are they going to get people coming back? I mean, there was there was a huge scandal in Ukraine because they ended up firing a lot of people for corruption who were responsible for mobilization. They were the guys going out there and getting people and getting them into the Ukrainian military. And what they're coming back now and saying is that, okay, they were corrupt, but they were also good at their job, right? And then they've been, maybe they've been replaced with people who aren't as corrupt, but they're also not as good at their job. And this is the part where you, you start, things start to get a little bit scary. So moving into this, this third point of, you know, again, what is the press and what is the administration pushing now, right? So the first the first point of all this was the Tucker Carlson interview. What did it reveal about Putin, Russia, but what did it also reveal about us, right? Then the second portion of what is the military situation on the ground right now, and it's not going well for Ukraine. And then this third point is what, is, what does what is being said by the press and the administration? Man, I said that weird. Um, <laughs> how does What does that tell us? about what is potentially going to happen because you're starting to see the rhetoric from the Democrats really come up to a level that almost seems a little bit absurd. Like, can we pull up that one article that I had where, um, oh gosh, what was it? I think it was the the Reuters argument where 
they were literally saying like, if gosh, if you don't fight, if Americans don't fight Russia and Ukraine, we're going to be, you know, fighting them ourselves. Yeah, here's the headline um, from Reuters. Do not let Putin win. Biden pleads with Republicans on Ukraine. There, there, was a, there was another one that was even like more like just off the wall. Here's the one from one. the Hill, Senate Democrat. Americans, yeah, Senate Democrats, will, Americans be, will be, yeah, Americans will be next on the front lines against Russia if Ukraine aid not approved. Really? I mean, think about that for a second. Now, again, what's scary about this is that they're claiming that, okay, well, if you give the aid, we won't have to be the ones to fight. I don't think that's necessarily true because, because again, once the attrition becomes less about equipment and money and more about people, this gets very problematic. And I, I don't think Ukraine's at a, at a point anymore where they can afford to, to lose a, a lot of troops. How are you going to replace those? So I, I think we're running into a situation where the more, deep, the, the more deeply we become invested in this through treasure, the more likely we're to become invested through blood. And that's where this gets scary because you've already got politicians saying you have to send the aid package. Otherwise, right? It's not send the aid package. And at some point, if that doesn't work, well, maybe this just isn't our problem. It's no, no, no. We have to send more money because otherwise we'll have to send troops. Otherwise we might have to get, we might have to escalate our involvement to actually coming into physical conflict with Russia. Yeah, right? I'd, that, like that's, to know, I'd like to know why they feel like Russia would invade us next. Why in the world well, is that can't. their logical next step? <laughs> Putin is not an idiot. You can say whatever you want about him. You can say that he's evil. You can say that he's immoral. I, w I didn't say amoral this time. <laughs> um, and, and and he is. He's he's a he's a strong man authoritarian. He's not a, he's not a libertarian, right? He's not a free market ardent capitalist. He's not. He, he, he's not a conservative in the sense that I would identify with. There's plenty of things I do not like and agree with this man on, but he is not a lunatic. If you actually listen to the interview with Tucker Carlson, I was actually joking with some friends. I'm like, oh, so Putin plays like Crusader Kings 2 and Europa, Europa Universalis 4 <laughs> because he, he knows so much about this history. He has this like, you know, he's spurging out about, you know, like, oh, when, you know, 864, the Kievan, the Rus, Kievan and, yeah. Rus was formed with the Rurik dynasty, and then the Mongols came and burned it all to the ground, and then the yeah. Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, and I was, like, listening to it, and and again, I was telling Nick before we started recording, I'm like, you know, 70 or 80% of this is 100% is accurate. Now, this yeah. doesn't translate to, and this is why we have a moral obligation to invade Ukraine and kill half a million people, but I just, I thought that was interesting that you, that he was going into over a thousand years worth of history because... As a Russian, he's obsessed with this type of stuff in, in a way that we just can't appreciate in, in well, the U.S. because we only have 250 years, not even 250 years of, of the U.S.'s history. And if you go back to like Jamestown, it's only 400 years. Russia's an ancient country in Ukraine as well. This, there's, there's, I mean, they, they trace themselves back to the Byzantines for crying well, out but, loud. But let me, let me, let me get, let me get to this point real quick about this whole idea of, you know, Russia poses this significant threat to the United States. Now, look, any country with nuclear weapons ha has the ability to project power way beyond its, its conventional ability. Yes. All right. But this idea that if we don't fight Russia and Ukraine right now, we'll be, you know, we'll be fighting them in our own streets or, or we'll just be fighting is absurd. Right, like China possesses, uh, you know, China's economy is orders of magnitude higher than Russia's. China's military is orders of magnitude more powerful than Russia's. China couldn't invade the United States if it wanted to. It, it, it is a it is a logistical and conventional nightmare. Well, right, if they like, just if they just think about the fact that I mean, it, they're three years into invading their neighbor, right, <laughs> and it's taking forever. It's taking and, half a million casualties, and yeah. Ukraine is nowhere near us nowhere near the well, and, the and, amount of power that that the US has and they're really going to say that that we're next on the chopping block no no well, what, I, what I, I don't think is that Russia I don't think, will invade the Baltics or Poland is what the yes the, the they're, they're saying that saying. what is Russians not going to stop with Ukraine and and like that's the part where okay again if you want to make that argument go ahead and make it but I want to see more than just bald face you know I, I want to see more than just assertions that that's what's going to happen because I think what's been demonstrated to Tina's point is it, it couldn't even it <laughs> It couldn't even successfully evade and take over its neighbor, which historically, and, and, and again, keep in mind that within Ukraine, it actually had a large part of the, por the population, at least in the eastern portion yeah. of the country, that is sympathetic to the invasion, right? right? You're not going to get that in Poland, 
Right? You're, you're not going to get hates that. Russia. They have, you're not going to get there's that. There's no love you're lost. Not, <laughs> yeah, you're not going to get that in Western Europe. What exactly right? is the U.S. interest in this, though? That be aside from the fact that we, as a people, tend to think that if if bad things are happening to other people in in other places, we we need to go and expend our blood to stop it from happening. That's kind of we we go and we police the world, but. The, the other question I have is like a lot of us, especially on the right, um, a lot of times the right used to really be into like going to wars. They were very hawkish. And, <laughs> yeah. and the left was always the anti-war people like standing up to the man. And now it's crazy because the left is the man now. And they're all about going to this particular war. And, um, and, and a lot of us on the right are kind of looking at this going, okay, there are a lot of, there's a huge backdrop here for us as well. Um, just even in the last few years, you had the whole Russia collusion garbage with Hillary Clinton trying to set all of this crap up about, mm -hmm. you know, Trump colluding with Russia. And there's still a huge portion of Democrats that believe that still, even though it's completely debunked. Um, and then on top of that, you've got um, Hunter Biden with all of his Ukrainian business dealings and, you know, lots of money for the big guy. And so a lot of us on the right are kind of looking at this going, I think this administration just wants to protect their their investments over there Tina, or their money I don't know what you're talking about. Hunter Biden was perfectly qualified to serve on the board of the Ukrainian <laughs> gas company. But do you see no. what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> no, the, I, like I, I, the whole propaganda, propaganda thing um, is just compounded when you look at it, the other side of this and the and the reason why the right might be a little bit uh, skeptical about this particular yeah. war and what exactly what interest exactly do we have over there I think I think there's a couple of things here to to your point I think in a weird way this has almost become a proxy war between the left and the right based off of frustration over, you know, the Russian collusion, you know, you know, components during the Trump administration. And then, you know, again, um, the whole issues with Ukraine and the whole issue with um, Burisma and, and all of these different factors. And then if, and, and then if you, if you take a step back, obviously Russia has been moving closer and closer with, with not only just with China, but also with India, with South America, South Africa, with Brazil, with the whole BRICS system and trying to create a counterbalance against the United States um, obviously, our, our allies in Western Europe are very, very, you know, skeptical of of Russian uh, intentions. So th there's a there's a lot of other conditions here, which, when you look at it holistically, you can say that yes, Russia has posed uh, at the at the very least a strategically hostile force to the United States, if not an outright enemy. I do think it's interesting, though, that as as you know, late as or as early as um, you know the the presidential debates between Mitt Romney and um, Barack Obama, Mitt Romney was saying that Russia was was a threat to the United States, and it was Barack Obama saying, you know, the 1980s called and they want their foreign policy. Oh yeah, back. I remember the Sarah Palin mm -hmm. thing. I can see Russia from my house. Which she, she never, she, she never actually yeah. said. Yeah. You know what? You know what she Tina did Faye say though. Said that. You know what she did say? Sarah Palin did say in 2008 that Russia would attack Ukraine, and she was ruthlessly mocked as an idiot. Yeah. By the same people that are now telling us that we're traitors, yeah. you know, for watching a Tucker Carlson interview, and you know, we're we're also traitors if we don't support another ninety-five billion dollar aid package to countries that are three thousand miles away from the United States. I've always found that to be so fascinating that the same people that that again ruthlessly mocked, and I, I was I was a kid, but I remember watching what the press was saying about Sarah Palin in two thousand eight after she had those comments about Ukraine saying that Russia would invade them. And if you were paying attention, remember that that paper I brought up from 1994, people that have actually been paying attention to this topic, that have studied the geopolitical situation in this part of the world far longer than anybody anybody else in, in the mainstream media or within the Democratic Party, for that matter, have been talking about this for a long time. And until five minutes ago, those people, when they were bringing it up on the right, they were derided as, as idiots, as being outdated, as being lunatics. Again, Sarah Palin's an idiot. Mitt Romney, oh, the 1980s called and they want their foreign policy back. They were totally right. But I think the reason that the right has abandoned neoconservatism and abandoned these approaches that were espoused by people like John McCain, by people like Mitt Romney, by people like Lindsey Graham is because, quite frankly, they looked at 
the last 25 years of American foreign policy, and they've said, how on earth has this benefited me as an American citizen? My country's turned into a tax farm for a global empire that's pushing, quite frankly, a narrative that I don't even agree with. Here's a, here's a question. Why do we need to spend $100 billion so that way we can queer the Donbass? Like, I, I, <laughs> I mean— I mean, that, honestly, a that's a couple the, seconds for my brain to register what you just said. <laughs> that's yeah. what we're being asked to do. Yeah. And I don't even think yeah. the Ukrainians want that done to themselves. So, like, the, the, I, I think that, the, the, quite frankly, the reason that you've seen this reversal where, you know, the left has been, went from being, oh, we're sticking it up to the man to cozying up with Raytheon and North Grumman. Yeah. And, and th- quite frankly, I'm going to use the word because there's no, uh, there's no better term, the deep state within the U.S., the intelligence mm-hmm. agencies, the military industrial complex, the foreign policy, you know, apparatus. The reason they've cozied up to them is because of the things we've brought up on this show, institutional capture. You shouldn't be surprised when the people that have engaged in institutional capture within every element of American culture and society, including the federal government, have now become the neocon party. Because guess what? When you engage in institutional capture within the military industrial complex, you're probably going to end up adopting positions that are favorable to the military industrial complex. And as the right has lost their influence within the federal government, within the different cultures, within the different, you know, business apparatuses, within the military industrial complex and the intelligence agencies and the foreign policy apparatus, they've become less interested in promoting what's good for them and more interested in, oh, well, maybe we should take care of our own country. Maybe we should deal with our own problems. We have $33 trillion in debt. We have a wide open border right now where 3 million people are pouring across illegally every single year. Let's focus on those things. And this is why you're seeing this disconnect where the average Republican no longer – it's not that they don't care. It's that they, they, they look at what's happening in the rest of the world and they say, we have our own problems too. Why do we constantly have to be the policemen of the world – when we have allies, how about we ask Europe to supply weapons to Ukraine? They're literally on their borders. They're the next on the on the chopping block, according to a lot of these articles. I mean, well, oh. well, that that and if that and if the GDP figures are to be believed, and I think these GDP figures are, are usually pretty accurate, Germany, the UK, and France all have larger economies than Russia, right? So, so this this idea that that Europe is incapable of defending itself against you know a, a renewed Russian horde that couldn't even pull off a successful invasion of Ukraine, right? The the fact that Americans are being asked to believe that, and again at the same time when Trump was was yelling at NATO that look half of you guys have the economy but you don't actually live up to your obligations within the NATO treaty in order to spend you know the, the minimum amounts on your own defense, and and you just rely on the United States to pick up the difference, and and. Now, a lot of those things are coming to a lot of the things that Trump was ridiculed for saying or saying that he was out of line or that he was inaccurate and didn't know what he was talking about have come to fruition. And and so the again, the American people, if you if you look at all the conditions in the backdrop of everything that happened, not just during the Trump administration, but during COVID and everything that's happened since then with the Biden administration, you have a significant portion of the population that to Christian's point is looking at this going, it's not that it's not that I don't care in the sense that, you know, uh, you know, I I I don't care what Putin does or I don't care what Zelensky does. It's more of this is just way down our priority list and I refuse to and I refuse to be bullied into believing that if if I don't vote to send hundreds of billions of dollars that we don't have over to defend a country for which we have no strategic treaties with that I'm somehow a traitor or a bad guy. A lot of us right? aren't, aren't while believing at the same time, it while at the same time being told that if I would like to focus on the things that are very real economic and security threats to the United States, I'm a racist and a bigot, right? And that's the part that's just pissing off the American people at this right. point. You have half the country that for decades now have been told if you don't do what the left wants, you're mean, right? And 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 the you know, whole and now all of a sudden it's like, look, we've got real concerns we want to address, and nobody cares anymore about being called mean. Nobody cares anymore about being called these things because we've all kind of recognized that this is just a political tool. Well, now right? they're, this, they're this throwing is, everything at the wall, hoping something sticks, because now they're trying to say that London's going to get nuked, everyone's going to get nuked, we're all going to get nuked. You know, there's all these articles lined up. You know, Russia threatens to unleash entire arsenal on London if it loses in Ukraine. Like all of this. And, and the way that most of us Americans look at this and go, well, if they were really serious, some of these other countries that are a little closer to the, the detriment of this would actually be taking some action. But they're not. They're not well, they're not being asked to do what we're being asked to do. 
this always go and and they would argue that you know again they would look at it as like well as a percentage of higher gd you know of gdp estonia has given more than the united states it's like oh, okay well great then i guess estonia has got this right we can just back off if we're going to if we're going to look at it that way so it's it's not that european countries haven't it's not that european countries haven't contributed to this the point is is that yeah they have because they should because well, they're I'm the ones I'm talking about that, boots on the ground they're trying no, no, they I want us that. to send boots on the ground no, it's because, and again, and the reason why they can't, the reason why they don't want to consider it is because their own populations have no stomach for it, right? And, and for good reason in many respects, right? No stomach for it and very little capability for it, right? And, and, and it's because so many of these countries with some notable exceptions have openly relied on the United States to provide for their security while at the same time condemning us for being, you know, these, our guts. these yeah. brutish guys running around, you know, just, you know, as a global hegemon and, and why can't we use diplomacy? Well, again, you just came, you're, you're coming head to head with a guy that diplomacy doesn't work the way that you would like it to. And once again, you're running to us to, in order to solve the problem. And the American people are tired of it because we're tired of being simultaneously insulted for, for being the sort of people that we are, which are the sort of people that can actually successfully fight conflicts and being told that we desperately need to intervene or else it's all our fault. And what you're seeing right now within the American press, and we're gonna, I'm going to use this to kind of transition as we wrap all this up and, and, and kind of summarize this. What we're being told by the American press right now is twofold, right? We're being told one of two things. The last ditch effort to get us to spend more and to commit more is, well, if we don't help Ukraine, then we're going to be the ones that have to fight. Well, first of all, there's no reasons why we would have to be the ones to, to fight this. The other argument is you're starting to see the press more and more really lean into this narrative that if this all goes if this all goes awry, it's all the Republicans' fault. It's all conservatives' fault. It's all MAGA's fault. Like you, you, you're starting to see all this stuff come up, right? It's all the it's all the Trumps, you know, people's fault because they love authoritarians. Here's here's what I'm going to say, and I think this is important. If if you look at the if you look at the past predictions that we've made on this channel. One one of the things that I said on, on how I thought this would all end, and you can go back. We actually have a reference to this. I think it was an episode we did back in March. I said, look, I, I think at some point you're going to have to get a negotiated settlement. Um, because if you don't do the negotiated settlement, then that almost, almost guarantees that the United States is going to have to send boots on the ground. Because I highly doubt Germany, France, or the UK is going to do it. And quite frankly, there aren't a whole lot of other militaries that want to get involved in a, in a land war over there because of what it could potentially mean for things like tactical nukes, right? So it, it would have to be it would have to be a military with the sort of force that the United States is capable of projecting, and and we don't know what exactly that would cause Putin or his administration to do or what they would resort to. So it's an escalation that that doesn't work in our strategic interest and it doesn't work in our favor. And so the question is, is like, okay, how do you end this then? If it isn't with the United States physically becoming involved in the ground or potentially invading Russia, which could very much, which actually could lead to nuclear war, right? If you're not willing to do that, what are you willing to do? Well, if, if you look at what I think Russia would settle for, I think Russia would settle for a couple of things. I think they either want to keep the Donbass or they want the Donbass to operate as a semi-autonomous region. They are not the Russia is not giving up Crimea. They don't see any reason to. It, it is the most Russian portion of, of what was formerly Ukraine, or what you could argue is still Ukraine, but has been occupied by Russia for for quite some time now. Right? They're not they're not giving up that up. So Russia's not going to lose any any territory with respect to what it gained before this invasion started. They're going to want some sort of at the very minimum, I think, semi autonomous region for the Donbas. Um. Because, and they're going to want guarantees that Ukraine does not join NATO. And they're probably going to also want some guarantees that, um, you know, of, you know, pushing back as far as what they would consider to be Western interference. Like Russia also likes to talk about like, the denazification. I, I don't think that Russia honestly believes that there's a huge Nazi threat um, in, in Ukraine. I think it's part of their their moral narrative for why they're doing this and why they have to continue to do it. Um, but they will probably insist on some sort of, you know, gesture narrative that I don't know that the Ukrainians will get them on. Like I said, I think it's the easiest thing that they can throw away if they need to, because I think it's more about the Donbass and I think it's more about NATO expansion. Um, on so the question is, how does the how does the West get a victory out of this as well, right? Because this is how you do it. You need it to be credible enough to where both sides can claim some sort of victory. 
Zelensky has made all sorts of wild stuff about like, we're going to take back, not only are we going to take back the Donbass, we're going to take back Crimea as well. We're going to push, you know, right. Okay. Well, that all sounded good when they were making massive gains. They're not now. And in fact, they may be on the verge of getting pushed back some to which additional money and equipment might not be sufficient to, to stem the tide. And so what happens is, is the Western nations, the people that have largely financed this war, right? This is Germany. This is UK. This is the United States. They pull Zelensky aside and they say, Here's what's going to happen. You're going to agree to some of the, you're, you're, you're going to forget Crimea. That ain't happening. You're going to agree to certain concessions within the Donbass region, right? And the reason why you're going to do it is because we're going to give you the Nobel Prize and we're going to give you tens of billions, if not hundreds of billions in um, funding to rebuild Ukraine. So you get to claim that you you stemmed the Russian advance, that you know the whole country almost fell. You pushed the Russians back, but here's that you also get to be the guy to distribute all the money, right? Which I'm sure none of that'll be lost in corruption. But you get to be the guy to distribute all the money to rebuild Ukraine, and you're going to be hailed in the West as as not only a a great wartime chief executive, but also as a peacemaker. Right, that's that's going to be the narrative. That's what gets Zelensky on board and his people on board because they're going to be the ones that get to distribute the money. And then what gets Russia on board is the you get to ostensibly claim that the the reasons that you provided for invading were essentially met. Right, Th that's the only way I can see this ending in a way where both sides get something of what they want, and we don't escalate this to you know U.S. boots on the ground. Because if this, if this does go to where, let's say, the United States says, okay, fine, we're just going to offer air support. And air superiority might be, it would, it would certainly be sufficient to stem any sort of, of Russian counteroffensive. It would certainly be enough to be able to give the Ukrainians an advantage with respect to you know, handling their own offensive. But Putin also knows this. And then the question would be, what does he do in response? And, and again, we don't know at that point because he's got nukes. Right, and it, and it's not as it's not as if he has to go through the same process Joe Biden would in order to utilize nukes, and so that that's why I think what we come down to is this sort of impasse, and the question is is that okay, how does Biden sell that? Because arguably, arguably, you could say that well, if the United States had just agreed early on that we're not going to add Ukraine to NATO because there's no reason to do it, and I really don't think there was, we're not going to add. Ukraine to NATO, right? And we're going to we're going to de-escalate some of the tension over in this area. They theoretically could have prevented this from ever happening in the first place. Like better diplomacy, the very thing the left always loves to scream about how good they are at soft power and diplomacy, they totally screwed it up in this case. So the question is is how does the left pull off a victorious narrative in the United States? How does this not look like we just spent hundreds of billions of dollars for the Russians to essentially get what they wanted before they launched the invasion? They just used their propaganda machine to do it, Nick. The narrative I just think, pivots immediately. That's how I they think do it. I think what's going to end up happening is one, the propaganda machine will automatically shift to President Biden brokered this masterful piece, right? And then when it comes to the money, what they're going to say is is that Unfortunately, we couldn't get a better deal because the Republic MAGA Republicans sided with the authoritarian Putin over the poor freedom fighters of Ukraine. That's going to be the narrative. So I, I'm, I'm saying it right now. This is my prediction for how this goes forward. And honestly, I believe this is the best possible outcome for what I can see on the ground right now is that sort of negotiated settlement with, with Biden claiming to be, you know, this again, grand peacemaker and the, the left wing press essentially just excoriating MAGA Republicans for abandoning the, the brave freedom-fighting people of Ukraine in their time of need. And, and I think everybody on the left, and like as far as the political apparatus, will dutifully get on board with that particular narrative. Nick, um, um, there- but, but again, I want to reiterate, that's, I think that's the best possible scenario. Yeah. The, the, the far worse scenario is that they continue to pour money into this it's not sufficient to actually achieve our strategic objectives. And then you have enough idiots in Congress which believe that, okay, well, all we need at this point is, is air power or cruise missiles. And then escalate this to a level that they're definitely not prepared for. And, and once again, force us into a situation where they'll say, well, now that U.S. troops are involved, right, the moment a U.S. soldier gets killed, now all of a sudden, if you don't support a full escalation, well, then you don't, you don't back the troops. 
Uh, Nick, there, there's a couple of links that I want to show our audience as we get close to the end here that I think just completely dismantle the narrative that you're starting to see on the left. I, I, I And I texted you this a few days ago. I was like, there's going to be a stab in the back myth. Yeah. And and for those who, who want the context, the stab in the back myth was basically the idea that Germany was betrayed in World War I. It depended on who you wanted to blame, right? The Nazis blamed the Jews. Other Germans blamed, you know, weak politicians, the Weimar Revolution at home, that Germany was going to win the war or at least get a negotiated peace. And then, you know, they lost the war on the home front. They didn't lose it on the front lines, right? That yeah. was what the stab in the back myth was. You're going to get the exact same thing in the, in, in, in the West from the media, from left-wing politicians pushing this narrative that Ukraine, we were going to win, and Ukraine was was beating Russia, and then Republicans stabbed them in the back. They have blood on their hands. They're yep. traitors. Again, the, this idea that you're traitors to a foreign country you're not even a, <laughs> even a citizen of. I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard this narrative. Yeah. But, like, I have examples of it right now. Here's a guy, ironically enough, an American in Kiev. This guy's account named Jay in Kiev. He's got eight, eight, He's not a small account. He's got 80,000 followers on Twitter, and he's got a video of Ukrainian forces retreating from Avdivka. And I've got the video here. Here's the Avdivka sign that uh, Zelensky actually famously took a photo of himself in front of. They're they're retreating from the city as Russian artillery is is you know bombarding this dirt road, which is the last road out of the city. This was taken just a few days ago when the Ukrainians were pulling out. And then he goes on to say that with no arms to stop the Russian advance, Ukrainian forces are leaving Avdivka. The GOP blocking U.S. aid for five months has directly caused this. I hope we remember who to vote against in November. And this isn't some random Twitter account. It's fun to like laugh at lunatics on Twitter, but this isn't some random Twitter account that's like pushing this narrative. It's also Forbes magazine that's pushing this narrative. Mm -hmm. Here's a headline for you. The Ukrainian garrison in Avdivka fought hard and fought smart but it didn't count on Republicans cutting off ammo supplies. And if you think that it's not enough for, you know, random people on Twitter or, again, the ideologically captured press in the United States to push this stab-in-the-back narrative that it's the evil Republicans that are going to cause Putin to win in Ukraine, here's what the president of the United States has to say in a press release that he put out on the same day that the Ukrainians announced they were pulling out of Avdivka. And by the way, and I should have brought this up earlier, when the Ukrainians pulled out of Avdivka, they were not able to completely pull out of Avdivka because they had the window three weeks ago, at least two and a half weeks ago. And instead of doing it, they sacked the commander in chief of the Ukrainian army that advocated for it when there was still an ability to do so. And then they lost that window. And so when they pulled out, it was kind of a disorganized pulling out. And the number of Ukrainian casualties in terms of killed, wounded, and especially captured in the city, probably number in the thousands at this point, which is part of the problem. Well, here's what Biden has to say about this disaster that was unfolding in Avdivka. He says in this press release, this morning, Ukraine's military was forced to withdraw from Avdivka after Ukrainian soldiers had to ration ammunition due to dwindling supplies as a result of congressional inaction. I've got one statistic to show that completely destroys all three of these narratives, this idea that evil Republicans are the reason that Putin's going to win and they're traitors to democracy and traitors to the United States and apparently traitors to Ukraine as well, despite the fact that they're American elected representatives that should be focused on things like, I don't know, fixing the southern border and addressing our $33 trillion deficit problem, or sorry, debt problem. I've got one source that completely destroys all this and it comes from the Ukrainians themselves. And here's what it is. Here... Here is the number of troop counts. This is from a Ukrainian account on Twitter. Here's the number of troop counts, and it's not a small account either. It's got 163,000 followers. This is a, a, a pro-Ukrainian account from somebody that's serving in the Ukrainian military that shows the number of Russian and Ukrainian troops operating along the Donetsk front right now over time, going back to September. And what you see is that the number of Russian units and Ukrainian units in September last year were almost identical. They were both under 40, 40 units each. Now what you see is basically there's twice as many Russian troops operating along the Donetsk front than there are Ukrainian troops. So it went from even number parity in September last year to a more than two to one numerical advantage for Russia in this theater of the war where Russia had a crucial breakthrough and managed to take the city of Avdivka for the first time in literally 10 years because the fighting there has been going back since the revolution in 2014. So 
I don't know. Do you think that maybe the fact that the Russians went from being even with the number of Ukrainian troops to outnumbering them more than two to one might have contributed to the fact that they managed to have this breakthrough? Or is it because of evil Republicans in Congress? By the way, the same video where this guy in Kiev, who's last I checked, not fighting on the front lines in Ukraine, is railing against evil Republicans blocking aid. Guess what? Guess what flag is on this guy's this guy's helmet in this video that he's sharing. Oh, that's right. It's an American flag on this guy's helmet. So it's not like we're not sending supplies to this. In fact, there's American supplies that are being used by these units pulling out of Avdivka in the video itself from this guy railing against Republicans. So the last thing I want to leave here is, remember when I gave you that like 1,000 foot view on what was going on in in Ukraine, going back to, you know, basically like 2022, you know, when the invasion began. Well, the last thing I want to leave you with is in last year during Bakhmut, Ukraine had about a million men in the field and Russia had about 500,000 in the field. So Ukraine had a two to one numerical advantage. As of this month, and for all the talk we've heard about massive Russian casualties, you know, five to one, 10 to one, 15 to one rushing, you know, to Ukrainian casualties, that's all cope. That's all cope. There's no way that Russia is taking 15 to 1 casualties when they're increasing the number of troops in Ukraine on a month-to-month basis. This is after casualties are accounted for. The number of Russian troops, and we know this from things like satellite footage. We also know this from pro-Ukrainian sources like the Institute for um, for the Study of War, which is a avidly partisan pro-Ukrainian source. I've even got their, their day-by-day analysis of the campaign pulled up here. What we see from pro-Ukrainian sources is that the number of Russian troops in the field are now north of 600, almost 700,000 men right now. So Ukraine has 1.1 to 1.2 million men, and Russia has about six to 700,000 men, closer to the 700,000 men. And the number of Russian troops is increasing on a month-to-month basis, even after the casualties that they're taking. So what does that tell you? That tells you that the numerical advantage that Ukraine had at the start of the war, where they had a more than three to one advantage, has now almost entirely evaporated to this point where it's now a 1.5 to 1.8 times advantage. And in some sectors of the front, like the Donetsk front, where you saw the fighting in Avdivka, where you saw the Ukrainian collapse of this frontline fortified city, what you see is actually a two to one Russian advantage. That, combined with the fact that the Russians actually have air superiority over this part of the front, not the entire front, but this part of the front, are the reasons that Russia broke through. Not because of evil Republicans, not because of supply shortages, even though we sent them $100 billion, not not for any of those reasons. The reasons that, that Ukraine is losing in this sector of the front is because Russia has air power and Russia has manpower, and it has never lacked for manpower. You, you can go all the way back to World War I and World War II. Russia has always had manpower. The problem that they usually have is they have terrible equipment, right? But like, <laughs> and it's not that Russia's engaging in human wave tactics where they're taking 15 to 1 casualties. No, the Ukrainians actually probably lost more men, certainly in the, in the finishing stages of the Battle of Avdivka than the Russians did. I guarantee you the Ukrainian casualty count skyrocketed in the last three days of the fighting in that city when they finally pulled out after they were operationally encircled and they had to run across open ground that muddy roads, not highways, muddy roads, and you know anything about Ukrainian military history, with Russian artillery strikes and airstrikes on them as they're trying to pull out. So again, this narrative that you're seeing from Twitter, from the press, from the White House, that it's it's evil Republicans that are causing Ukraine to lose. No, it's the fact that Russia has mobilized 700,000 men and poured them into Ukraine at the same time that Ukraine hasn't increased its troop count in a year. That's the reason why. And quite frankly, the people that are pushing this narrative are doing it because they want to take more money from American taxpayers to send to a war 3,000 miles away from us at a time when we have a crisis here on the border. When we did our border episode, we got like 400,000 people that listened to that in part because they care about that problem right now, not the problems that are going on with countries with borders that, that are in another continent on Russia's border. It's not... The last thing I'll leave is I, I tweeted something today. Where <laughs> you said last thing like I know. last two things ago. I I, mm-hmm. I, I I I tweeted this, and this is the last thing I'll say on this because it's just really frustrating. I said, no one has yet to tell me why the average American should care about the borders of a foreign country not, la- not allied to the United States that is over 3,000 miles away from the U.S. 
at a time when there are more illegal immigrants entering the U.S. each month than there are U.S. citizens being born. If you want to be mad at them, go ahead. But you shouldn't be surprised that all the people are that all these people have other priorities than you do. And that doesn't make them traitors for having different priorities either. Calling them traitors is a great way to radicalize people against you. I think that was an excellent summary. <laughs> no, I mean the, the whole thing, the whole explanation, well, is, is why why is this going why is the war taking this turn in Ukraine? Because again, um the whole Stabbed in the back narrative is is what you're about to see in in the press. Um, that's what you're going to see. It's all of our fault. If only we would have believed more. If only we would have spent more. If only we we would have been as dedicated as the left was to Ukraine winning. Well, then they would have. And let me let me finish it with this. I want I want Ukraine to win. I don't want Russia to win this because I I don't like the sort of aggressive operations that that Russia took in. I think predominantly for the purpose of territorial expansion. And I, and I don't find the arguments that Putin made compelling or sufficient to justify what Russia did. However, I also find the argument that the press has made and the administration made to also be heavily deficient with respect to a good understanding of the truth. And understanding the truth and understanding the true motivations and understanding what it's really going to take is actually pretty critical to being able to be successful within conflicts. And it seems like this is a lesson we just refuse to learn. And both sides have been guilty of it. But the thing that is especially frustrating right here, and, and maybe, maybe in some strange way this needed to happen, because the administration, and by the administration, I don't just mean Biden, I also mean the federal government in general. I mean the institutions which make up the federal government have for too long just assumed that the American people will go along with whatever narrative they pick. The press has assumed that the American people, as long as there's consensus within the press, the American people will go along with it. Because after all, they're supposed to be the watchdogs, right? They're supposed to be the objective analysis of what's going on in the world so that the American public know and understand and can make good decisions. And what we learned during the Trump administration, what we learned during COVID, and what we have learned post-COVID, especially with the withdrawal from Afghanistan and the war in Ukraine, is that we just don't care what you say anymore. You're not going to convince us. You can throw us all the expert reports you want. You can call us whatever you want. You can threaten us with whatever you want. Let me make this abundantly clear. We don't care what you call us anymore. Your booze mean nothing to us. We've seen what makes you cheer. And when we point out very real concerns with respect to Ukraine, when we point out very, very real concerns with respect to immigration, when we point out very, very real concerns with respect to the border or our economy or the cost of living or inflation, we are constantly told by a federal government and a very obedient press that we're the problem, that we just need to sit down, shut up, do as we're told and listen to the experts. And if we don't, we will be punished for it. And when lo and behold, your predictions fail on everything from the economy to climate change, to wars overseas, when your predictions fail, you never come back and say, gosh, we got it wrong. You always point the finger right back at us and blame us for the failure. And we're done with it. We're done with it. So congratulations. If you were literally looking, look, <laughs> if you were literally looking to break the faith of half the country in various institutions that I would argue it's pretty important for us to be able to have some faith in, you've done it. And you continue to do it on a day-to-day -day basis. The difference is we just don't really care anymore. It doesn't mean we don't care about our country. It doesn't mean that we don't want things to improve. We're just not as convinced that we're all in it together anymore. And that truly is devastating. And that is something I hope that we can recover from. I really do. But we're never going to get there when the administration, when the federal government, when the press continually make horrible decisions. And then instead of actually coming forward and presenting an argument and telling us the truth and being upfront with what people want and what they want to accomplish and what it's going to cost to do it. If instead you're going to insist on the narrative that you have insisted upon, which is anything we want to do is justified because we're the good guys and you're all vile oppressors. Well, I've got news for you. We just don't care anymore. The insults don't mean anything to us anymore. 
So something's going to have to give at this point. But I can guarantee you this much for the politicians out there that are saying, well, if we don't give even more money to Ukraine while you simultaneously ignore problems at home that are desperately affecting Americans, if you're going to insist that if we don't do what you want, then we'll be the ones fighting the war over there, well, I can tell you right now, good luck with that because I don't think it's going to turn out the way you want. All right. We went a little bit longer than I anticipated, but look, this is an in-depth subject. And, and one of the things that we really wanted after this Tucker Carlson interview and after everything that's going on on the ground and what we're seeing with the budget battles up in Congress is we wanted you to be able to listen to this on your drive, whatever you're doing at work, in the background while you're working on something, we wanted you to listen to all of this and walk away with it with a good understanding of what's going on and why from our perspective. And obviously, we're not the only perspective out there. So go and seek the other ones. Go listen to other people on this and see where you come down on the issue based off of facts and an analysis, not someone trying to bully you into believing one way or the other. We want to thank Good Ranchers once again for sponsoring the show. Go to GoodRanchers.com, use promo code Nick, get yourself free bacon with your subscription for up to four years. It's a pretty good deal, right? And that's like genuine American meat, not the crap in a feedlot coming from some other country. So go do all that. Thank you very much for joining us and we'll see you next episode.